actually, the world, the whole world is actually run by accountants with a spreadsheet. You might not know this, but that's true. At uh, some point, an accountant in TFL is going to go, you know what, let's just save money by not printing any tube maps at all. Uh, this will be driven as well by you know, the digital age and everybody having smartphones. And somebody may one day go, well, there's no point in having paper maps. TFL have already stopped producing and printing bus maps uh, a couple of years ago, which was a very sad, uh, very sad day. Uh, could the tube map be next? Yes, I think it could. Uh, they'll just assume that everyone will have one on, on their phone. But then I always came up with the idea that maybe you could um, have like a machine in a ticket office or in the ticketing area where it printed out a custom map for you. So if you wanted a map without the, access, the accessibility blobs, you could do one. If you wanted one without the overground or trams, just pure tube, then you could sort of select options on a machine and have them printed out. Maybe not at every tube station, maybe at those, the pink visitor centres which they have at some of the key major London railway stations. A kind of a customizable print your own tube map. I'd like to see that be trialled at the very least. I think, I think once 4G goes in there, I think there's going to be a, a strategy of, of getting people to use smartphones and um, because they can personalise it. If, if people have mobility issues, they can flick a tab on the app and it'll give them a, 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 a different way of, of working, um, working with their way through the network. It can also integrate it far more effectively with the bus network, with all the other networks that exist. It, it makes, it'll be a human-focused app. An indicative tendency to get rid of maps. They're making them harder to find. I mean, they're aware that many people now have maps on, on their phones on their mobile devices, tablets, um, either just reproductions of a fixed map or a dynamic map. Uh, and I think that the moment is clearly away from paper maps. It costs money to make them. Fewer and fewer people are using them. Uh, I think the days of the paper tube map are numbered. There's no doubt that not just in London, throughout the country, and I expect worldwide, there is this move away from printed matter. Um, with a somewhat naive view, yes, but it's all on the internet. Um, a lot of it is. Um, horses for courses is a horrible cliche, but not everybody's got an iPhone, and not everybody actually is comfortable with using a little device to be told what to do. The paper maps will stay. I really do. And the experience of organisations like the Ordnance Survey is that Paper maps are still selling. In fact, I think they even re reported a growth in paper map sales in, in the last year or so. And you know, you never know what's gonna happen in the future. We could have some major disruption to cellular networks or we would need paper maps, I think. So I hope, I hope that paper maps are here to stay. So the tube map um, is no longer the tube. I counted up the other day the other day, weeks ago, all the nodes that are on that map. And by node, I mean you know, like a station point, a tick or a block, because obviously now it's not just the underground. It's then they put on TFL rail, the trams, uh, the cable car, uh, you're gonna have cross rail, uh, you've got the overground. Um, I think, I can't remember the exact figure. I think it's like something like, it might, when the Elizabeth line is certainly 400 and something, there's only 270 tube stations, but it's 400 and something if you include all the overground and, and DLI, etc. I think by the time you put all of the Elizabeth line on, it's going to increase the number of stations shown in total on that map to like oh, just over 500. Um, and that's, that's ridiculous. And the fact is that, that then I, we worked it out about 40% of the tube map is no longer. London Underground, and that's being very forgiven, that forgiving. Um, that's not including stations which are like Tube and Overground or Tube and DLR. They still count as underground. But pure non-underground stations will now account for 40% of the Tube map, which is crazy. I don't think anybody would have the nerve to change it, even if it was shown that something much better could be done. I, I think we're, we're approaching another 1933 here, where Stingmore's pseudo-geographical maps, there was a little bit of a battle with Beck and whatever, and LT didn't really want to do it. And when he did it, mm, actually, this seems to be working better. Um, we haven't got quite to the point where somebody has demonstrated something better. You know, a piece of paper, a pocket map, is, is a finite amount of size. 
you just can't keep adding stuff and adding stuff and adding stuff. Eventually, it will be full and it will break. Imagine if there's always talk that London Overground might take over some of the south suburban, southern, southeastern lines. You, you couldn't have that. You mean you literally couldn't have that on a pocket-sized tube map anymore. At that point, it, they would have to concede and go, we have to go bigger than this pocket-sized map. But they've got no money to do that. So that might be the time where they go, well, we want it on the map, but we can't afford to print out these pocket maps anymore. So The tube map will be redesigned. And it will include the possibility of having every other mode on it. Whether we will always keep a Beck inspired tube only diagram, the jury's out. Maybe there's still going to be a place for that. But certainly as we start to use smart ticketing for everything, we are becoming more and more mode blind. As long as we know that we can get on something that's going to move us from where we, where we are to where we want to be, even if we want to meander, then I don't think we're going to care so much whether it's a, an overground or a, a metro or a tram or a light rail or a suspended airline. As long as we know it, we're going to get to where we want to be and we're paying the cheapest amount for the journey, I think it's probably going to move to a time where everything is integrated and things will probably look a bit more complicated but then we'll have the ability to pick layers and bits that we want to see um, but I'll still hanker after whatever city I go to just picking up a nice free schematic of the local metro system to add to my collection. These journey planners that do the thinking on your behalf are doing quite a lot of damage to people's cognition. Now obviously these things serve a use, you, know, you visit a city for the first time you're going to spend one day there you've got one place to get to and then you need to get back to the airport then of course the easiest thing to do is just um is just to um give you some directions but what we know is that if you rely on journey planners and you know simple directions to left and right then you're not going to learn about um, the city in which you're in. You're not going to learn about its basic structure. So if you're planning on hanging around a city for longer than a day, then maybe it would be a good idea to learn something about it. And you know, automated journey planning sat nav absolutely does not give you any learning about the structure of where you are. It inhibits it, it stops you from learning about it, which means if the device ever fails, you're literally at square one. You don't know anything about the city. A lot of people now, more often now than even 10 years ago, they don't look at the wall for a tube map to find out where they're going. They look at their phone and they look at City Mapper and they look at all sorts of other various apps to find their way around. So whilst a visual representation of the entire network will always be a thing, I don't think it's going to matter so much in the future because it's going to be only a sort of last resort reference point. And the thing that people will be using when they want to find their way around is more likely to be something on their phones, something that can you know, be zoomed in and out of or be more dynamic and changeable. That's going to be the main way people find their way around. The kind of flexible interactive map that's just come out in New York um, is a quantum leap forward. I think it, it, it has come forward first in New York because of certain specific problems that New York faces. Um, first of all, you have so many different um, service patterns. We're accustomed in London to having just what New Yorkers call local lines. So, for example, uh, the Jubilee train stops at every station on the Jubilee line. It doesn't go onto any other lines. The only um, express versus local we have is the Metropolitan line, where you can have the fast and semi-fast and the slow services. But that's the exception in London. In New York, that's the rule. Almost all of the lines have got four tracks. So there's two tracks for the local stopping services stop every line, every station, and then there's two express tracks which go whizzing past and go to remote destinations. Now to express that on the map is a problem, especially if those uh, patterns of service change in the evenings and in nighttime and on weekends. So you actually need to have several, either several copies of the map or what they've actually done is to somehow encode that information into the map. So for example, the uh, current um, 
official map of the New York subway has little text along its station saying which trains always stop there, which sometimes stop there, and so on. And there's a lot of information to read and digest. If you have a interactive map that can switch according to time of day, it flips over into a night mode, into a weekend mode, it automatically redraws itself to show what the current service pattern is. So I think the city where the service patterns are complex and changeable is a big driving force for having this kind of electronic map. But also, a lot of New York was built on the flat using the cut and cover method. You dig a ditch, lay the tracks and cover it over. And so it's fairly easy for trains on different lines to switch over. So on weekends, for example, when they're doing engineering work, they can easily redirect the end train onto the Q train tracks or whatever. Um, and that means the map, the actual topology of the map can change significantly. And it's not economical to get someone in to, to redraw the map every weekend. But if you have a computer program, as they do, which can take on board information about where train services are being rerouted and redraw the map, that is, is a major improvement. One of the, the freelance map designers in New York, Eddie Jabour, has been saying for some time that the whole idea of a static map you can print on a piece of paper is so 20th century. We now have the technology and the need to have 21st century maps, which cannot be printed on a piece of paper because they're dynamic. They change with the time of day, with the day of the week, they change with engineering. And in a way, it's kind of a gimmicky thing that on this new map, they show the trains moving along. I think it's a beautiful idea. Um, that doesn't convey much information, but it does show, it, it semiotically shows how much the map is now a living picture of a living network. So I, I think that this is the way things are going to go in, in a matter of, I guess, five years. In five years' time, there won't be any paper somewhere else. They'll all be dynamic electronic maps like this. I think this is the future. Um, I was only involved in the production of the underground map from 1984, I think, till 1987. Um, I was asked, I can't remember, I think it was 2004, to completely redesign it because they were aware of a lot of the shortcomings of it. And one of the things that I focused in on was Beck's original diagram measured eight by six inches. I don't know what that is in uh, metric equivalent, but um, it's still, for practical purposes, the same size with twice as much content. And I said to them that a lot of the problems that were caused by the map was it was too small um, and came up with a design that was a lot bigger and I said to them, you do realise, of course, this is still going to have to fold um, to the same size. Otherwise, it won't fit your leaflet racks. And the response I got was, oh, that's a thought. Um, that's pretty important. Um, the design went through the usual toing and froing. Um, they asked me to look into showing some aspects of the service pattern on the Metropolitan Line, which, as you know, actually operates virtually as separate railways out of Baker Street. And um, in those days, you know, even then, the Hammersmith and City was separate. Um, and I tried to explain that this won't work. If you want to try and show the Met Fast train separate from the all stations stoppers or whatever, um, you're going to get into trouble because the Northern Line doesn't work as one service. The Central Line doesn't work as one service. And fortunately, they did agree with me on all that did get dropped and the design was approved and it was all ready to go to print and then they took over London Overground and asked me to put London Overground on the map and I said yeah I can do that but it's going to be a start again job because it's going to change the geometry of all of London. London Overground goes everywhere. Oh we've got to go to print next week. Really? Why? And the, the map that I did never got used. And we're still soldering on with the same one that they asked me to replace in 2004. Okay, do we need a radical redesign of the map? Now, people who know my work will know I've created all sorts of interesting maps in the past. I've created curvy maps with no straight lines. I've created um, a map of London based on circles. Now, 
just because I create a map, that doesn't mean I think that should be the map. That's important to bear in mind. Um, I like to explore and I like to play and maps are very visual things and you really can't know whether a map is going to work until it's there in front of you. So yeah, I, I guess an you know, idea for the map, I say, well, maybe let's try and design a map like this. This might give us certain advantages, certain disadvantages, but we have to create the thing in order to evaluate, evaluate it fully. We can't, just, we can't just evaluate ideas of maps, we have to see the real thing. And then I really, you know, user response is also important. You know, because I can have the best design map in the world, but if users hate it and refuse to use it, then there's no point having it, I've failed. So yeah, I put the maps out into the wild as well. But that's the important thing, just because my map has some sort of presence out there, just because I've uploaded it to a forum, it doesn't mean I think that that is the correct solution. Um, so I think that any radical change in the design is going to be very difficult for people to, to digest. They, they are accustomed to using the map in a certain way, they're familiar with it. it. It's become their icon of London. It's become their picture of London. So to change it means the picture of London's changed, which means London's changed. And it, it, it's, um, I think it'd be immensely difficult. I think they would have to have a very strong benefit to motivate any such move. Uh, and I know Max has um, played with lots of experimental designs of orbital and so on. And none of them deliver any major improvement in the usability. Maybe it's next to 2% efficiency in finding a way around, but that's not going to motivate anyone to shift to a radically new design. So I, I'm quite sure that the map will continue forever in this form. So maybe a more careful designer working with the London design rules can do a better job. And I think that's the case. I don't think London needs a radical redesign with crazy new design rules. I think London needs the same design rules done better. You have to make the distinction between the suitability of design rules and the quality of implementation within the design rules, the skill of the designer. The marketing people will want to start waving their hands about and saying, telling the whole world about this wonderful new design, inviting people to scrutinise it more than they would. This is exactly what happened in 1933, where they put a note on the front and telling us about a radical new design for an old map or whatever. Um, inviting, as it happens, what Beck came up with was a lot better, and it was accepted. My own view is, let's have a much better designed map, which can be done. It's not that difficult. It can be done if you know what you're doing. And just print it and stick it on the internet and issue it and don't tell anybody. And I wouldn't mind betting that the vast majority of people will find it easier to use. They'll be none the wiser that they found it easier to use. But that isn't the point. Surely the whole point of any piece of information design is to make it easier for the recipient to understand what they're being told. They don't need to know that they found it easier. Um, what's important is to make it easier. That's the real criteria.